Right, a huge welcome for the first time to author John Haven with The Falsification of History and What Was the Real Truth Behind the Sinking of RS, RS Titanic in 1912. Taking us back 100 years to the famous Titanic disaster, which hit an iceberg and sank, right? Well, maybe it did. But John covers inconsistencies with the official tale, and you may not that one again. Famous names in the finance world, Rothschilds, Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and possibly a business venture that didn't work out, culminating in the loss of Morgan's no claims bonus, possibly paid for with innocent lives. And an official story that stubbornly sticks to the unfortunate accident theory in case closed. But how well does this stand up to independent scrutiny? That's fine now, please welcome your name. tell you tonight, it's quite a, a complex little tale, or quite a complex large tale, so what I've tried to do, i put together a PowerPoint presentation that hopefully tries to simplify it. You must bear in mind that there are two or in three strands running concurrently through the whole story, and of necessity, I do tend to skip from one to the other and back again, and I try to make it make sense, but please bear with me. If you, there's bits that you don't follow, because like I said, it is quite complex, but it does all come together at the end. So, hopefully bear with me. And the other thing to bear in mind is that I'm not a professional speaker, I'm a writer and author, so if you're all expecting being our crane, then you have to all get your money back now. <laughs> I'll do my best. Okay, so off we go. We all know what that chip is, and we've had it thrust at us almost from being this high, this story has been part of our folklore for as long as anybody can remember in living memory. So we all know what that chip is, or do we? That's actually not the Titanic. It's identical to insist of the Olympics. So what do we know about what happened on that night of 14th, 15th of April 1912. Not an awful lot really. Although we hear so much about it, everyone thinks that they know the story. Well trust me, you don't. And this is what we're coming to now. We know for sure that a very large ship sank in the early hours of the 15th of April. And we know that there were more than 1,500 lives lost. And that 700 survivors were rescued by another ship, the Carpathia. But once you said that, you said everything. Everything else is really up for question, seriously. And I'm going to show you how that is the case. So let's start by having a fresh look at, uh, at some of the facts. Um, so, shall we? Moving swiftly onwards. Yeah, so to, to come up with the story that I've come up with, obviously it wasn't all my work, but there's a lot of my own research gone into this, and, that, and a lot of the stuff in there is stuff that is unique to me. So where did I get it from? Well, this is where I got my information from. I looked at the transcripts of both the inquiries. There were two inquiries about the Titanic disaster. One was the American inquiry, one was the British. Looked at both of those. I looked at Howland and Wolf public records. Howland and Wolf was the shipyard that built the ships. Okay, various other sources, libraries, internet, blah, blah, blah. And the one thing that really struck me about it all was that there were so many unanswered questions and anomalies with the official story that made me just think that, hang on a minute, let's have a closer look at this. So what does the official story consist of? It's basically all those things. Can we all read that at the back? Is it, is it large enough? Yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So at the risk of just standing here and reading the slides, um, it's basically all propaganda from the White, white Star Line, Dozens and dozens of eyewitness accounts, hardly any of which agree with each other. Contemporary newspaper reports, which I'm sure some of you are aware of this, this phenomenon. Whenever there's a disaster that's not as it appears, um, the first reports that come out, 
you never see them again, a lot of them, because they change the official story as time goes on, and some of the reports contradict the new official story, so you never get that. So by looking back at old newspaper reports, I've actually found a lot of stuff that's never mentioned and absolutely conflicts with the official story. Okay. So the, the inquiries were generally regarded as a whitewash. Okay. And the conclusions that they came to were so obviously incorrect as to be mind-blowing. There was also a British and US government cover-up, which again, I'll, as we go on, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about that. And one of the things that has been responsible for the apocryphal tale about the Titanic, one of the major things that has been responsible for it, is a book, which some of you may have read, and a film, which some of you may have seen, and it was this one. I need to put on here. It's called The Night to Remember. It was written by a guy called Walter Lord. And Walter Ward, just for a bit of background on him, he was an ex-CIA agent. Now, the first thing that interested me was what on earth is an ex-CIA agent doing writing a, a story about a shipping disaster 40 years previously? And the conclusion that I came to on that was for the same reason that the CIA get involved in anything and everything, and that is to cover it up and obscure the truth. So, the Titanic myth that we all know and love so well is a result of that book and that film. And trust me, 80% of it is utter hogwash. Right, so let's just set the scene a little bit. We have to turn back the clock a little way, first of all. A guy by the name of J.P. Morgan, John Pierpoint Morgan, who was a big American financier at the turn of the 20th century, from the 19th into the 20th century. Um, very close links to the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and all the usual suspects. Okay, he bought the British White Star Line, which was the line that eventually built the Titanic and the Olympic and the Britannic, the three sister ships. Okay, the British government, because it was a foreigner, they had to sanction the purchase. And they imposed certain conditions on that purchase, on that sale, which Please bear that point in mind because that will become very important a little bit later on. Okay, there's Mr. Morgan himself. What a nice man. Okay, so in 1907, Morgan asked Harland and Wolf Shipyard, who almost exclusively built ships for the White Star Line, by the way. Uh, to build a new class of luxury liners, and he was going to call that uh, the Olympic class. And work started, as it says there, in 1907 at Hallow and Wolf Shipyard in Belfast. And it was going to be three ships. Firstly, the Olympic, closely followed by the Titanic and the Britannic, which came a little bit later. And these were going to be the largest moving objects that had ever been built at that time. Olympic and Titanic would be virtually identical but significantly there were some differences, and again, we'll, we'll come on to that a little bit later as the, as the story develops. Okay, so in 1910, this is where we swap over onto another little thread, which you're gonna have to bear in mind as well as, as we go through it. In 1910, in what appears at first sight to be a totally unrelated incident, seven extremely high-powered American financiers met in total secret at a place called Jekyll Island, which is off the um, coast of Georgia in the USA. Okay? They were the representatives of those powerful financial organizations, J.P. Morgan himself, and as I said before, the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers. Okay? It was all been an absolute secrecy, and this is documented, uh, and the documentation is available, so this is not my speculation. No surnames were used at all. And their plan was to introduce something into the American economy called the Federal Reserve Bank. Now, I guess most people have heard of the Federal Reserve Bank. Is there anyone who doesn't know and wants me to explain what the Federal Reserve Bank is? Don't be shy. Okay. 
We all know what the Federal Reserve Bank is. But just in case someone's too shy to put hands up, I'll just give you a brief picture of what the Federal Reserve Bank is. Think of it as the American version of the Bank of England. Okay, so it's the American Central Bank that has the responsibility for the issuance and creation of money. Okay, now, the reason for the secrecy was that there was some powerful opposition to this plan. I would cover that. Why was the Federal Reserve Bank so important? It was one of the next step in their plans for world domination, basically. They needed the Federal Reserve Bank to just to, to backtrack, say, 20 years before 1910 to about 1890. It's all, the decision had already been taken. Now, this might sound fantastic to some of you, but others may know that this is the case. That in 1890, World War I was already in the planning, but there was no way of financing it because it would have taken absolute massive amounts of money, huge amounts of money. And the only way that they could do that was to come up with a way of cre creating money. And the way that they decided to do that was by introducing the Federal Reserve Bank, which was basically going to usurp from the American government the ability to create and introduce money into the economy. So it was so important because World War I was a big part of their plans for the 20th century. And that's why it was brought in. But as I say, there were powerful interests opposing the Federal Reserve Bank, not from any benevolence of the masses, of the ordinary people, but only because it would seriously diminish their own fortunes. And this, this guy was one of them, Benjamin Guggenheim, you may recognise the name. Another guy was John Jacob Astor. And Isidore Strauss. Now, neither of these, these were very, these, these were three of the richest men in the world, but the, none of them uh, derived their own fortunes from finance. It was industry, retail, leisure, but not finance, and that's very important. I'll just give you a moment to read that, I won't read it out myself, but that's, that's an important statement from Henry Ford that Henry Ford made in 1918. And he was talking about the Federal Reserve Bank. And a little bit more recently, a gentleman by the name of Benjamin Fulford, who some of you may have heard of, came out with that statement, which is what we're talking about tonight, basically. Part of what we're talking about tonight. Okay, so why were these powerful guys opposed to the Federal Reserve? Because, as I said, they knew that the Federal Reserve would undermine their own personal fortunes, because they weren't going to be involved in it, basically. So it wasn't through any benevolence that they were opposing it. It was purely selfish reasons. So let's, you know, let's get that up front straight away. The reason that it would impact on their own personal fortunes was because when you introduce a, a way of creating money into the system that is not done by the government and it's done by private interests, every note that comes into circulation, and this is true of our country today even, has a portion of interest attached to it, which is owed to the bankers, right? So the Bank of England produces money, and it's not the government that asks the Bank of England to do it. The Bank of England does it as a private corporation, and the government has to pay interest to the Bank of England, believe it or not. And that is the reason for the national debt, nothing else. So any other BS that the government comes out with for the national debt is nonsense. I'll tell you right up front, right now, it's because of the way the Bank of England operates. So, and that causes extreme inflation. We all know that throughout our lifetimes, how much prices have gone up, how much wages have gone up, maybe not in the same proportion, but things just constantly go up. And the reason for that is not the rubbish that we're told by the media and the government, it's because the interest has to be paid to the bankers. And that's the only reason for inflation. Okay, so extreme inflation would be very dangerous to these guys who oppose the Federal Reserve, and it could even have destroyed their fortunes, so that's why they were opposed to it. 
indeed, after the Titanic incident, just so happened that Mr. Morgan himself acquired their businesses anyway. So, just something to bear in mind. Okay. Morgan was also the largest shareholder in IMM, which is International Mercantile Marine, which were owners of the Californian. And for those of you who know the Titanic story, really know that the Californian was the ship that got blamed, or the, the captain of the ship that got blamed for the Titanic disaster. Okay, so Morgan was involved in that too. And the reason for that will become apparent as well. Okay, and IMM also owned the Lusitania, which, as it rightly says, that's another story for another time, but believe me, that isn't all it seems as well. Okay, let's just look at the general situation surrounding all Atlantic crossings in the 19th century. After all, the 19th or 19th century had only finished 12 years previously. Um, but it was mainly immigrants going to America. And basically, the ship owners didn't care. They were, just, they were just worthless lives, these people, you know, just poor people. So they overloaded the ships. They overinsured the ships. Insurance scams were absolutely rife. They didn't care. Okay. And it was also an industry that was noted for fraudulent practices. So, moving on a pace. The first of the ships off the production line was the Olympic, which was to all intents and purposes identical to Titanic, and that was launched early 1911 and had its maiden voyage on the 14th of June that same year. Now Olympic was not immune to little disasters itself, it had quite a few, shall we say, cough mishaps. Um, on its maiden voyage it almost sunk an American tug. Okay, but the big, the biggie, as far as Olympic was concerned, was that in September of that same year, as it was leaving Southampton Harbour, steaming down Southampton Water to head out into the channel, it was involved in a horrendous accident with a Royal Naval Cruiser called HMS Hall. Now, that was never publicised, all right. It is available information, I'm not saying you couldn't find it out. But how many people knew that? Put your hands up, that that, that actually happened. Okay, about six people, fine. Okay, so, yeah, very important point. Now, the damage to Olympic was far more serious than they first thought. It limped back into Southampton Harbour for initial, initial testing. There's HMS Hawk. That was almost a write-off as well. Um, but Olympic went back to Southampton, and they did the initial damage assessment and they found a huge hole, and by, by huge hole I mean a huge hole, you'll see a picture of it in a minute. But even worse than that, there was all sorts of unseen damage as well. There were bent and broken beams, metal beams, there were thousands, hundreds of thousands of rivets that popped. Steel plates were completely ripped away. It was a mess. It was a mess. There we go. And that was the the main bit of the damage, but it stretched. It had an impact almost, down almost one third of the ship. Now the biggest problem that it had was, it had twisted the keel of the Olympic, and this was caused in a huge list of port. It was quite dramatic actually, the list of port. And again, that becomes important in a little while. Even the temporary patches to get it back to Belfast, because bearing in mind in those days it was, this was the biggest ship that had ever been built in the world. The only place where there was a dry dock big enough for it was at Belfast. So they had to patch it up at Southampton as best they could using divers to get it back to Belfast, to the dry dock. And even the patches to enable it to do that took two weeks. Okay, so back to the dry dock for proper damage assessment in October 1911. In the meantime, whilst all this was going on, any accident involving a Royal Navy ship, there has to be an inquiry, and that inquiry is undertaken by the Royal Navy. And of course, <laughs> wouldn't you just know it, who was at fault for the accident? It was the Olympic. Now, this was pretty serious. 
pretty serious. Um, the Lloyds of London declined the insurance claim, which was an absolutely massive blow to the White Star Line. Now, it was not only liable for damage to Olympic, but it was also liable for damage to HMS Hawk, and this was going to run into many, many millions of pounds, and in those days, millions of pounds were serious money. And the upshot of it would be that had that been allowed to continue, then White Star would have been bankrupt. There's no, there's no question about that. <coughs> the, I believe that the conclusion that the White Star Line came to was that the Olympic was absolutely irreparable because of the twisted keel, mainly. I don't know any of you seafaring people, but a twisted keel on a ship is pretty serious. Um, so they got basically two options, scrap it, which would have definitely meant the end of the line for not only White Star, but Holland and Wolf as well, who, if you remember I said, they almost solely built ships for White Star. So if White Star went down, then so did Holland and Wolf. Obviously they went for the patch-up option. I think they were just buying time, to be honest, to see, see what could happen. So they patched it up and that took seven weeks. So bear in mind that seven weeks out of commission, it was a lot longer than seven weeks, if you take the time before it, prior from after the collision until the seven weeks began, and then had to tack the seven weeks onto the end of that. It's a lot of time for a ship of that magnitude to be out of service. The speculative investment that JP Morgan and Co. had put into the Olympic class meant that they needed a return on their investment really, really quickly. And one, not only were they having to pay for all these repairs, but they were losing the revenues that would have been generated by the Olympic traversing back and to across the Atlantic, um, taking passengers. So it was a huge, huge, I can't stress that enough, it was a huge financial blow to them. Okay. Now we know that steel struts were put in place to brace the keel. And I will return to that towards the end of the presentation. So just bear that one in mind as well. Okay, and also to expedite the repairs, they actually borrowed a, a, the, the starboard propeller from Titanic, which was not finished, but it was well underway. It was probably about two thirds of the way built at this time. Okay, so basically they needed Titanic in service as quickly as possible, along with Olympic, to start generating revenues. Otherwise, Okay, so Olympic was actually involved in yet another collision, believe it or not, as when it got back into service in January 1912. And it lost a propeller blade. It had to get back to Southampton. And we know that there was severe vibrational damage, which obviously didn't hold the course at all. And it created enormous stress on what was an already badly damaged ship, even though it had been patched up. So back we go to Belfast again. Propeller blade replacement. Now it's interesting this because according to Harland and Wolf records, a propeller blade usually took about five hours to replace. It was, it was just a case of unscrewing bolts, big bolts, I grant you, but just a case of unscrewing bolts. And with a team of a few men, that, that could have been accomplished in five hours. It actually took four days. It was in dry dock for four days having that propeller blade change which is a little bit strange, but we'll have a look at that for now. Okay. So what, what were they doing for four days? Well, strangely enough, Olympic was, had been launched by this time, although it wasn't finished, it was sat there in the water. Um, and they were photographed together several times in Belfast around this time. Don't forget, this is like three months before Titanic's maiden voyage, and they were together. Originally, the, um, the Titanic was meant to be going out on the 20th of March, but that was put back to the 10th of April, partly because of all the constant with Olympic. And there they both are, the two sisters sat together, almost identical, almost. Let's look at the differences, okay? On the forward part of sea deck, which is Uh, 
Um, Olympic had 16 port holes on even with space, and Titanic only had 14. So if you see pictures of the two together, it's, it's easy to tell which one's which. Okay. And on the after part of E-Deck, Olympics was open, and they decided to enclose Titanic, for whatever reason, best now to the told. Okay, so did they switch them? Well, let's have a look. I think they decided to switch them. With a view, you probably guessed by now, with a view to sink in what would be the Olympic to claim the insurance money. Okay, and that, I, I think that decision was taken shortly after Titanic had been launched. Okay. It wasn't as that big a job. Um, in those days of non mass communications, there weren't hundreds of photographs, there weren't TV programs about them, there weren't news broadcasts about them. It would have been quite simple to do. They took a hand-picked group over one weekend, and there is apocryphal evidence for this, that there are urban legends existing amongst the White Star, uh, sorry, amongst the Harland and Wolf, the descendants of the Harland and Wolf workers from that time, that said that they'd been passed down from grandfather to father to son, <laughs> that, that this had gone on. And that was, that was bribery and threats to families, that if anybody said what was really happening in that shipyard over that weekend, then they'd probably never work again, and that could have been a death sentence in those days. No such thing as social security. Never, never work again. And as I say, it would have been a reasonably simple procedure. Okay, only minor changes. They, they put carpets down in Titanic, which they never planned to do, and the reason they did that, I think, was to cover the scratched liner from what had been originally Olympic. They need to change the nameplates, they need to change the life belts, they need to change the life boats. And there's Titanic when it was launched with the 14 port holes on sea deck. And there's Titanic on its maiden voyage with 16 port holes. <laughs> Draw your own conclusions on that. Okay. So what other evidence do we have? Okay. There are photos showing 16 portals, one of which you've just seen by magic. Uh, Olympic was open to the public prior to its maiden voyage, and incidentally, does anyone not find it strange all the fuss and hoo-ha there was over Titanic's maiden voyage? And yet Olympic didn't get that. Why, why would that be? Olympic was the first one off the production line. Surely that should have been reserved for, as I say, the first one off the production line, not the second one. But again, we'll come back to that. Okay. Another little piece of evidence for a switch was that a guy called Lawrence Beasley, as a second class passenger, he reported a list of port throughout the voyage. He was a survivor, obviously. And uh, he mentioned it to the, to the crew or to anybody who'd listen. But of course, it was ignored. Now this is interesting as well, the sea trials. Olympics was a full day on the open sea, which is what the Board of Trade who controlled these things at that time, that's what they demanded, any big new liner entrance, entering service. It was a proper, comprehensive trial with Board of Trade inspectors crawling all over it. And that's exactly what happened for Olympic. Titanic, a couple of hours on Belfast Lock, no speed tests, no lifeboat tests. And also, when Titanic docks at Southampton, having left Belfast earlier, ready for its maiden voyage, only two firemen and stokers signed up for the voyage. Now, this, this again leads me on to something else that is extremely important. Lots and lots of people said lots and lots of crew members who were constantly looking for work and constantly out to work so they would never sail on her again or that class of ship again and it's also important to know this is another thing that never ever gets mentioned but during that time of Titanic's maiden voyage there was actually a massive countrywide coal strike going on and there were no ships leaving the UK for America or for anywhere for that matter because coal was impossible to get so there were thousands and thousands of ship workers, stokers, 
waiters, stewards, you name it. Thousands of them were out of work because they only signed on for one voyage at a time. No, no matter which <coughs> line they worked for, they only signed on for one voyage at a time. So as soon as they docked back in the country again after they'd been away, they were out of work until they could find the next ship to sail on. Now there were, there were thousands of them like, laying idle because of this coal strike and none of them signed on. Why would that be? Okay. So just to recap a little bit, why, why would they make a switch? I'm making a serious allegation here. Why would they make a switch? Well, as it says, Olympic was virtually worthless. It was uninsurable. Damage beyond economic repair, I believe. White Star Line and Harlan and Wolf would have been bankrupted. So did Mr. Morgan, well, forever with an eye for the main chance, look at it as an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone? Because now this leads us back to the other thread, which is the Federal Reserve again. We have the opponents of the Federal Reserve, Messrs. Guggenheim, Astor and Strauss. It would have been far too dangerous to just bump them off in separate accidents. It would have just been so obvious. Who would suspect that in the aftermath of a shipping disaster of that magnitude that these people have been murdered? If they were murdered, of course. So, back to J.P. Morgan's kill two birds with one stone. Not only was he going to sink the Olympic disguised as the Titanic and claim his insurance money, he was also going to get rid of these guys who could have made life very, very difficult for him and his oppos and their plans for world domination. Okay. Let's take a little look at Edward Smith, the captain of Titanic, who had also been the captain of, captain of Olympic on his maiden voyage as well. And he switched Titanic for its maiden voyage. Captain Smith is generally regarded as being a hero in all the apocryphal tales that you read about Titanic. Captain Smith, the hero that went down with his ship. He was actually, an, he had an appalling safety record. He was generally known as a a braggart and a show-off, and he used to take great delight in throwing these huge liners around as though they were toy ducks in a bath, basically. Um, he had more than, more than several serious accidents in his career. I'll just highlight a few. He had three in the Olympic for a kickoff: The Republic, the Germanic, the Coptic, the Majestic. crew were killed, and that was, that was well covered up actually that one. So again I dug that out but I only had one source for that. There's no other mention of it anywhere, the fact that crew were killed in the, in the Majestics accident. So he was a he was not the guy that was portrayed to be, shall we say. Okay, so I believe what happened was Bruce Ismay, who was the owner of White Star Line, no it wasn't the owner, I beg your pardon, he was the managing director of the White Star Line. He was brought into Ismay's confidence and Ismay used his record, his appalling track record as a lever, and virtually twisted Smith's arm to carry out this conspiracy that they all, they'd all planned. Okay. They were told that the Californian would be standing by. This is the ship of whose captain actually got the blame for the Titanic disaster from the, from the two inquiries. Okay. And Basically, he had to comply, but in doing so, he ins insisted on choosing his own crew. And again, this is something that's quite interesting because it's a known documented fact, and this hasn't been covered up, this is quite true. The fact that just before the Titanic's maiden voyage, all the senior officers were swapped around. They brought in a new one and all the others went down a notch, which they weren't very happy about. But that did actually happen. Smith chose his own crew for that. Pecking order of his existing officers were affected. Now, there are several puzzling facts about this. Again, as I've already alluded to, despite the coal strike that was going on, they still had difficulty finding crew. What did these people know, these thousands out of work? 
There was all sorts of rumours going around amongst the crew members of all the different ships. That there's not all not all was well with Titanic. Chief Officer Wild, who was the guy immediately below uh, Captain Smith in the, in the pecking order, he actually wrote a letter to his sister just before Titanic embarked from Southampton. And in that letter he said, I still don't like this ship. Still don't like this ship. It was the first time they'd been on it, allegedly. Okay. Olympics maiden voyage had been absolutely fully subscribed. Titanic was just over half full. First class passengers wanted to transfer to Titanic when they found that it was actually gone and make the voyage even despite the cold strike. They only offered them second class cabins and I believe that was done to put them off because if Titanic had been full and given the fact that they knew that they were going to sink the thing they wouldn't have been able to save as many lives as they thought they were going to be able to. So I believe that was the reason for that. Okay. And even more, just before it embarked, 50 first class passengers cancelled their reservations. These were friends and colleagues of J.P. Morgan. This is all documented. J.P. Morgan just didn't turn up. He was supposed to be on the main voyage. He, he, he was on it. And he actually rang from France and ordered some priceless bronzers that he was going to transport back to his home in America and had them removed from the ship at the last minute. He said that he was ill, that's why he couldn't make the voyage. But he was seen two days later in perfect health as a French seaside resort with his mistress. And Florence Ismay, the wife of Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the Lifestyle Line, she was originally going on the voyage with her husband, but again at the last minute she cancelled. She said that she was ill, but she was seen later that week in Ireland with her family on a touring holiday. Okay. So what do we know about the Californian? We all know that the Californian was the, the ship that never came to Titanic's rescue and got the blame for the disaster. Yeah? Is everybody aware of that fact? Right, well, California, this is, this is quite an interesting issue as well. Again, despite the cold strike, California left England, I think it left London, five days before Titanic. Uh, it's had a full complement of coal somehow. Nobody knows how or why, but we know why perhaps. It's had no passengers. I mean, just, just that fact on its own. It's had no passengers. Why would you send a ship across the Atlantic with no passengers? People were clamouring for, for passengers across the Atlantic, but everybody was stranded because there were no ships leaving. So the one that is leaving has no passengers. Does that make sense? It's just me. Okay. And also, this is really interesting. I, I was gobsmacked when I read this, and I'm sure you will be as well. There was no cargo. Does anybody know what the cargo was on the California? The only cargo that they had. No. Munitions. Sorry? Munitions. No. Oh. 3,000 woolen sweaters and 3,000 woolen blankets. <laughs> exactly. There she is. The Californian. And there's Captain Lord, who was the master of it. So. On the 14th of April, the Californian came to a dead stop in the middle of an ice field. Now, the, the story we all hear about that is that, well, it, of course it stopped because it's in the middle of an ice field. It's too dangerous to carry on. No. Captain Lord, he was a tall man for those days. He was six foot. But for some strange reason, he decided to spend the entire night of the 14th and 15th of April on a sofa in the chart room fully clothed. Again, it's all documented. This is not conjecture on my part. It's all, all documented. He ordered the boilers to be kept fired. Now, normally when ships shut down, for whatever reason overnight, they shut the boilers down to save fuel. Okay. And the crew were made to be on standby overnight. Okay. So what was he expecting? <coughs> what was he expecting? I can't imagine. 
I really can't remember doing. So back to go to the Titanic, and again, I'm sorry we keep having to swap around, but it, it, because everything's happening concurrently, it's, it's not just a, a chronological story, it's, it's backwards and forwards, so I hope, I hope you're sort of following it, and I do apologise for the intricacies of it, but it's the only way I can tell it, really. Okay, so again, I mentioned this before, huge fanfare and build-up to the main voyage, Olympic, nothing. Could it possibly have been the reason for Titanic's massive publicity? Was it to attract the, the social greats of the day to it in great numbers, including Messrs, Strauss, Guggenheim, etc.? In fact, much of American high society was aboard. So let's move on now to Titanic, the maiden voyage. She set off from Southampton on the 10th of April. She called it Cherbourg in France, and then she called it Queenstown Island, which is now called Cove, by the way. And then set off across the Atlantic. And late on the evening of the 14th of April, we know that the Titanic received six messages from the California three of which were warnings of icebergs, which is fair enough, but three were personally addressed to Captain Smith from Captain Lord. Now, we never found out what it actually said in those messages, but I would love to. I really would. And what, one of the things that the... So we do know what it said in one of them. It, it was a precise location of where California didn't stop for the night. And why would it do that? I mean, just think about that. With the benefit of... Um, hindsight, if you like, on what we now know about what was going on. Why would he tell him exactly where California stopped for the night? What was the point of that? They weren't even part of the same shipping line. Okay. It's also a documented fact that Captain Smith delayed turning the Titanic west on the southern track. There were different tracks going across the Atlantic for different times of year, mainly to avoid icebergs. But he delayed it for 10 miles, which actually put Titanic directly into the atmosphere. Was that a coincidence? I don't. Well, again, this, this is something that did come out. This is something that is prevalent in stories like this. We know that for a fact that the radio operators were busy with passenger messages, so they weren't really taking an awful lot of notice of other, other ships and, and their no wireless traffic at all. So everything was concerned with getting the first class passengers <coughs> messages to their family and friends in America who were probably waiting for them at the key sign. Okay, so according to them, they didn't receive the Californians' last messages. So again, draw your own conclusions. Now we know that there are several other ships in that ice field in exactly that same region that night. And they were all travelling at full speed, so why was California stopped? It's stopped and closed down for the night, and we're told, as I said before, that this is because you cannot run at full speed through an ice field. But that is just hogwash, and I'll come on to that a little bit later. This was Titanic's route from Queenstown across to New York. You can just see the edge of the, edge of the ice field there. It doesn't show very well on the slide, but it's, it's there. And it's just there where Smith turned into the ice field. And that's where the accident took place. If it was an accident. Okay, so... <coughs> get to the actual incident itself. It's 11 o'clock in the evening, two lookouts. Fleet and Lee started their watch, their shift. Okay. And strangely enough, as Captain Lord had done, Captain Smith also decided to spend a night fully clothed on a sofa, not in his cabin. 
1.35 p.m., the iceberg was sighted and a warning was sent to the bridge. And the helmsman was ordered to port around it. Which, incidentally, doesn't mean turn to port, it means turn to starboard. It, it's, it's a bizarre thing, but it actually means you turn to starboard, which is the right, and you port around something, it means that the, the rear end swings out like that. Sorry, if nobody can see my arm, I do apologise, but it swings round it like that. Um, so that's called porting around it. Okay, now, that would have been fine. That would have, that would have worked perfectly. They would have missed the iceberg, completely missed the iceberg, apart from the fact that somebody reversed the engines, which guaranteed a collision. Because the speed Titanic was going at, Porting around it would have taken it at full speed, would have taken it a wide berth around the iceberg and past it. But reversing the engines meant that it, didn't, it, it, it was like slowing right down, so it didn't have time to get past the iceberg. So that actually more or less guaranteed that there would be a collision. So why was that done? Again, it's all very, it's all very strange, all very weird. <coughs> Uh, First Officer Murdoch, who was on the bridge at that time, so he was in, effectively in charge of the ship while his superior officers were sleeping, or off duty, did he deliberately guide Titanic into the iceberg? Because it was him that gave the order to reverse around. This, this is an experienced guy, you know, he, he wasn't a, a rookie. He, he'd been around a bit, he'd been on the ships for 20 years. He knew what he was about. You don't get to become First Officer of a huge liner like that without knowing you know, what's right and what's wrong when you are ins issuing instructions to helmsmen. So that, that in itself is very strange. And it leads me to think that something wasn't right there. Now, another interesting point is that Titanic's turn circle was 1,280 yards, which as it says on the slide, is about two thirds of a mile. <coughs> and its stopping distance from full speed is at 850 yards, which is just under half a mile. Right. Now, in, the, in his testimony to the American Inquiry, Lightoller, who was the second officer, said that the iceberg had been visible from two miles. So, when you just read that information again, given that fact, <coughs> why did it hit an iceberg? If it's stopping distance and from full speed, and it wasn't even travelling at full speed, it was 850 yards, and the iceberg was visible from two miles, Something's not right. The iceberg should easily have been avoided in the book. The other aspect of this is that there were, despite what you may believe or think, there were only actually six eyewitnesses to the alleged iceberg collision. Only four of them survived, and all these were working class. And what I mean by that is they were the ordinary seamen. Right. No passengers witnessed it. They were ordinary seamen aboard the Titanic. The two officers that witnessed it, well, we'll see what became of them in, in a short while. Murdoch allegedly shot a passenger and then immediately committed suicide, something which his family have vehemently disputed ever since, or his descendants. <coughs> Six officer Moody allegedly drowned, which just left. Quartermaster Oliver, who stated at both inquiries, I saw nothing, even though it was on the bridge. The helmsman, Hitchens, who was immediately transferred to a job as harbormaster in Cape Town upon landing in New York. Lookout Frederick Fleet and Lookout Reginald Lee were the only two who actually gave any evidence at all at the inquiries. Any or all of those could easily, easily have been coerced and bribed, in much the same way that the Harland and Wolf ship workers were. Just the simple expedient of threatening them with the loss of livelihood. It would have been a piece of cake. Okay, another strange anomaly. After the, 
the iceberg hit, or Titanic hit the, the iceberg, which we prefer. Captain Smith ordered Titanic half speed ahead for five minutes. Now, why would he do that? The thing was taking water. Was he trying to get closer to the California? Then as soon as they spotted a ship on the horizon, immediately he closed the engines down. Very confusing. So what we'll do now is I'll just do this little recap and I think it's time for a break. Okay, so now we have a ship standing dead in the water. Californian. Sorry, Olympic. <laughs> Titanic. A rescue ship standing by, which we believe to the Californian. We have messages sent from California stating its position, for whatever reason. Smith can see a stationary ship on the horizon, and he assumes it's the Californian, and there, therefore everything is going to plan. And I think we'll leave it there on a little break. to read that, that's where we were. Okay, so the bottom line is Smith sees a stationary ship, and he assumes it's the Californian, and everything's going to plan. <coughs> so, the rockets are launched. Okay, so Titanic starts sending out its, out its signal rockets around midnight. Um, the signals are signals were seen by the California's crew, but only white ones, and that's significant because Captain Lord was heard to ask his senior officers more than once what the colour of the rockets, the, the, the ship that they could see on the horizon was sending up, and he was told white every time he asked, and he kept asking the same question over and over again. <coughs> Was he expecting red or blue? Because Titanic actually sent red, white, and blue signals up. So the Lord actually did nothing because he kept being told that it was white signals only. So that begs the question really, were these white only rockets, were they from another ship? Now, I'm not sure how clear that is, but three. here's the Californian, okay, and here's the, the reported position of Titanic, the red boat, but here was the actual position of Titanic. And in between the Californian and the Titanic, again, this is something that is not reported widely, there was a smaller ship called Samson. Obviously that's a little bit exaggerated, but you can see the effect of the curvature of the Earth. Because of the distance between the Californian and the Titanic, which was actually 19 miles, although according to Titanic's reported position it was only 11 miles, the curvature of the Earth was actually obliterating Titanic, as you can see from the diagram. However, Samson, significantly, was visible. <coughs> now, the Samson, what was all that about? I hear you ask. Um, right, well the Samson's actually an illegal seal fishing boat. And it was discovered much later after the event that it was actually in that vicinity sending up white rocket signals only. Now why was it sending up white rocket signals? Rather a strange thing to, think to do if it wasn't in distress. But, as a seal fishing boat, it was actually culling the seals from all the ice flows around in the ice field. And it was recalling its small rowboats that it sent out to the various little icebergs, growls and ice flows that were around there. And it was calling them back in. And to do that, it was sending up white rocket signals. And how do we know that this was the case? 
Well, first of all, the captain admitted it after the event, long after the event, and he also said that he'd seen coloured rockets from the other direction, in other words, in the direction from where Titanic was. So I believe what happened was that Californian actually saw the white rockets. Ward was privy to the information that Titanic's distress signals were going to be red, white and blue, and so he did nothing with the white signals. But that, that, those white signals have since been interpreted as coming from Titanic, which is incorrect. Obviously the captain of the Samson never came forward because what he was doing was highly illegal. Titanic sent up 22 multicoloured rockets and according to Captain Lord, they only ever saw one once. So. So, so this is, this is quite an interesting conjecture. Did, did Titanic even hit an iceberg at all? I mean, you, you, on the surface of that, I just sounds such a ridiculous question, doesn't it? It just brings everything that you've ever known about the situation into question. And it, it just seems impossible at first glance. But there were only four, as I said, working class witnesses for want of a better description. Um, and one of those fleet, the lookout, he completely refused to answer questions. Oliver saw nothing at all. And Hitchens, the, the uh, helmsman, he was given a new job in South Africa very hastily before the British inquiry. So, and the other lookout, Lee, he gave complete, conflicting testimony. So in other words, what he said at the American inquiry and what he said at the British inquiry were two contradictory things. But then there's another interesting incident, which again is never covered in the apocryphal story. And this, is, this concerns something that was referred to in contemporary reports as the Yellow Funnel Steamer. Okay. Uh, in the aftermath of the alleged collision with the iceberg, there was a Yellow Funnel Steamer spotted by several, not eyewitnesses to the accident, but several people who came onto the deck of Titanic stated to newspaper reporters in New York that they'd seen a yellow funnel steamer disappearing off into the distance. And also, there was a lifeboat floating nearby when the Carpathia picked up the survivors that was definitely not from Titanic because it was a different colour and a different design. And furthermore, all the ice on the deck, I mean, again, there's lots and lots of eyewitnesses reports about the, the deck being covered with large chunks of ice. Fine. Every, everybody assumes that that's from an iceberg, but it was an extremely cold night. And there was literally hundreds and hundreds of yards of rigging on Titanic. The wireless masts were, were just, in effect, like rigging, going from one end of the ship to the other. And they would have been at, at 28 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what the temperature was at the time. They would have been absolutely liberally coated with ice. Any collision at all would have shaken loose literally tons of ice from not just the rigging, but from the masts and all the different cabins and, and structures on the deck. So it's quite feasible that even if it didn't hit an iceberg, there could be copious amounts of ice skating around the deck. So was the yellow funnel steamer? chance an icebreaker that did the disastrous damage to Titanic. Okay, let's, apologies for the skipping around a bit here, but it's necessary because <laughs> there's so many things going on at the same time and it's, and it's difficult to do it as a uh, chronological story, if you like. But Edith Russell, who was a British survivor, was adamant, adamant that she said that Titanic's officers told her that the Californian was on its way to pick up everyone. This was in the immediate aftermath of the collision with whatever it was. Okay, so the officers told her that the Californian was on its way. The Californian wasn't on its way. The Californian wasn't even aware of what, A, where the Titanic was or what was going on at that point because it had not received its signals. So how did the officers know? The lifeboats were less than half full. Everybody knows that. I mean, they were. I mean, that's, that's no exaggeration. The lifeboats were less than half full. But why would that be? What on earth would possess officers, experienced officers, to actually send out lifeboats half full? Well, we hear all sorts of stories about how that was, but to be frank, none of them 
stand up to close scrutiny. Um, I believe that the reason that the lifeboats were sent out half full was that Captain Smith knew that the Californian was, was standing by and he ordered the lifeboats sent out half full. He thought the, Titanic was uh, the Californian was closing on the Titanic. So the, the lifeboats were sent out with the intention of bringing them back again to ferry everybody else off as well. So it was, it was an expedience at that time. Get as many people on board as you can on these lifeboats. Don't matter if they're not all full because they'll be coming back very soon. Because the Californian is steaming towards us, closing the gap. So it doesn't really matter. Meanwhile, Lord was still waiting for his coloured rockets and the Californian was just sat there doing nothing. And eventually, eventually, it actually dawned on Smith and the rest of the CD crew that the Californian wasn't coming, and by that time it was too late. Okay, around 5.30 in the morning, Lord actually discovered that the Titanic had sunk. They actually kicked the wireless back into action again, because the Californian's wireless had shut down at midnight. <coughs> don't ask me why. I don't know. It doesn't make sense, but it did. He got the wireless back on again at this time, and he, and he found to his horror that the Titanic had already sunk. And he set off towards them at that point, but it was too far away to, to do anything. And at that same time, Carpathia was just, just actually reaching the, the lifeboats from Titanic that were all, by this time, tied together and floating along, being rowed along in convoy. All the lifeboat passengers were taken aboard Carpathia and given medical aid. Bruce Ismay, the managing director of the White Star Line, who you remember was on board the ship for his major for the major voyage, but his wife wasn't. He was allegedly in complete and utter shock, distress. He was taken to the doctor's cabin and sedated, but that's contradicted by the fact that. At around that time, he also sent three messages around ten minutes apart to the White Star officers in New York. So again, a strange anomaly. And once they arrived in New York, all the crew were immediately subpoenaed to attend the official inquiry, which was to take place the following week. Sorry about this. Just skip some of them. That's an interesting photograph, actually. It's nothing to do with the... Uh, Conspiracy at all, but it's just those are the that's the first Titanic lifeboat arriving at the Carpathia. Somebody on the Carpathia took that to picture, which is a very poignant. Well, let's move on to inquiries now, because again, these were generally regarded as being complete whitewashers, both of them. We'll cover the American one first. Incredibly. The witnesses that were called were restricted to only answering questions that they were asked without elaboration. So if they were asked a question, did such and such happen, they were allowed to say yes or no, but they weren't allowed to elaborate on that. Seems rather strange to me. <coughs> Lightoller, the second officer, very evasive, almost as though he was working to a script. He was caught out lying time after time by the, uh, by the head of the inquiry. He actually claimed at one point that it was in the water for almost an hour, which is absolute abject nonsense. The water temperature was 28 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, which means that in, that, in the water at that temperature, your life expectancy is around four minutes. And it's, a, and it's an interesting point that a lot of people, I'm sure, not you good people here tonight, but a lot of people think that everybody on Titanic, that was killed on Titanic ground. Well, no, they didn't. They froze to death. The, you know, the ones in the water froze to death. They didn't drown. I guess some of them must have done. Lightoller referred to the choir as a complete farce, and he wasn't wrong. Um, well, stacks and stacks of contradictory evidence. You know, I've got loads of examples, but there's far too much to cover in, in, in an event like this without boring and all silly. Okay, Fleet, again, he was very intransigent, he refused to answer questions. When you read the, when you read the transcript, it, it looks to me like he was told to say nothing, 
and in his best to try and say nothing, but it was coerced by the, the guys who were cross-examining him. And as a result of that, because he was just an ordinary guy, he wasn't very eloquent, he became very angry and agitated. And it was obvious that he was covering something up when you read the transcripts. Okay, and this is an important point as well. At the American Inquirer, they actually brought in two or three, I can't remember which, but there was two or three experienced sea captains asked the, asked the questions, and they all said that an iceberg of the size that allegedly, allegedly collided with Titanic can be seen three to five miles away in on moonless nights. And also, significantly, it's normal procedure to maintain full speed because of that fact. So why was California stopped? It really does beg the question. <coughs> okay, so a couple of weeks after the event, the surviving crew members docked at Plymouth, Plymouth Harbour in Devon, and they were immediately held against their will. They were, they were kept in a holding pen, for want of a better word, overnight. There were 165, or 168 perhaps, and they were all held against their will overnight, which is obviously illegal. They had no access to union representatives, and they were forced, coerced, to sign a document that they believed to be the official secrets act. I think it's more than likely that they were threatened and bribed with the same old thing. Speak anything about what happened on that night and you'll never work again. So moving on to the British Inquiry. <coughs> this was conducted under the auspices of the Board of Trade. The Board of Trade was the organisation that used to uh, oversee anything that, that went on at sea. And it was the Board of Trade, for example, that set rules about the numbers of lifeboats that ships could carry, they did the inspections of ships that were meant to be seaworthy, etc. So it was, it was done under the auspices of the Board of Trade, chaired by a guy called Lord Mersey, who was an interesting character actually, because Lord Mersey, Mersey had been wheeled in on several occasions before, where there was sort of dodgy circumstances about ships being sunk, uh, strange accidents, insurance scams, and he'd been used by the British government on more than one occasion prior to the Titanic uh, inquiry. So he, he was quite a colourful character as Lord Mersey. Okay, and it's interesting as well that the large loss of life was partly due, partly obviously, not, not wholly because of the conspiracy, but partly due to the, the adequate Board of Trade lifeboat regulations which said that they only needed to carry enough lifeboats for half the, uh, half the passengers in effect. So it's, it was very extremely unlikely that any inquiry conducted by that Board of Trade would be anything approaching impartial, because it had to protect itself. It's an old thing, isn't it? You know, we know, we know the drill, we know the MO. And it was at the drill hall in London where the acoustics were so poor that neither spectators or press could ac accurately follow proceedings, so they couldn't really understand what was going on. And again, I believe it was all part of the same whitewash. Both inquiries, in fact, were regarded as a whitewash at the time. If you read contemporary newspaper reports, even the newspapers of the time, time who were you know, very pro-establishment with making statements like whitewash and things like that. So, and interestingly as well, Harold Sanderson, who was um, direct, uh, one of the directors of the White Star Line at the time, what, under his cross-examination, he referred to the Titanic as the Olympic all the time. On at least, on at least 12 occasions I counted in his testimony, he called the Titanic the Olympic, which might be, might be just an accident, but... And there's, there's Lord Mersey, a pillar of the establishment. And that's an actual photograph of the, the inquiry at the drill, at the drill all the time. Okay. So yeah, it was a whitewash. The British Inquiry found that Captain Smith wasn't to blame, the lookouts weren't to blame, the design and construction of Titanic wasn't to blame, the officers and crew of Titanic weren't to blame, 
The white star line wasn't to blame. It was Captain Law's fault. Obvious, really, isn't it? So it's poor old Lord as a scapegoat. Although I'm sure he was in on the plot. It was a bit rich to actually pin the entire blame on him. And unfortunately, that's what history has done. History tells us that Captain Law was the, uh, was the villain of the piece. Okay, Mersey deliberately steered the evidence that way. Any, any, anything that was said that, that pushed the blame in any other direction, he, he shouted it down. He changed the subject. He moved them on. Ignored or shouted down any other version. Okay, and he actually, actually deflected the attention away from lots of other things that were, I would have thought might have been sort of fairly important. Things like Titanic's bulkheads <coughs> should have been at least one deck higher. That would have probably saved the ship. And the fact that the Board of Trade, if you remember right at the beginning of the presentation, I told you about the sea trials, the sign that Titanic off after about an hour and four minutes of sea, sea trial on the on Belfast Lock. Okay, now where did the British government fit into all this, do you think? Because it's, none of this could have been expedited without the collusion of the government. Now why would the government want to do that? What, what, would, what would be the the motive for the government to do something like that. Okay, let's have a look at that. Okay, so it couldn't have happened without their collusion. There's no doubt about that. Interesting that there would have been absolutely massive political repercussions if White Star and Holland and Wolf had been bankrupted. For a start, there would have been 25 to 30,000 people out to work in Belfast at the shipyard. And when you take into account all the dependent industries, that figure would have risen much, much higher. Okay, the Liberal government who were in at the time under Asquith would probably not have been re-elected. But more importantly than any of that, obviously important, but not as important as if you remember, again, casting back back to the beginning of the presentation, I said that Morgan came to an agreement with the British government, which he had to do in order to take over the White Star Line in 1903. Okay, so in taking over the White Star Line, he agreed that any White Star Line ship at all could be requisitioned as troop carriers in the event of war. And given the fact that we know that World War One was already well, the plans for World War One were already well advanced. You have to trust me on that. It is true. This was extremely important. If Morgan had not had this agreement, he could have just taken the ships away. Even if the White Star Line had gone bankrupt, he would have been able to take away the assets from the company, which would have been the ships, and the government would have lost their troop ships. It says on the next slide, basically. As a major creditor, Morgan would have been perfectly entitled to exercise his rights to seize those assets, the ships, and the government would have had no true ships. So the government therefore fixed the inquiries, in my humble opinion, in collusion with the US government, which did the same on their side of the pond. As we know, they all work together anyway, don't they? Okay, and then, well, not least of all this, there was an element of insurance scam involved as well. It cost 2.5 million in money at that time to build, which is, it's near like 200 million now, but it was 2.5 million it cost. <coughs> um, the damaged Olympic would have been insurable for much, much less if it had ever managed to sail more than halfway across the uh, Atlantic again. Um, and it was a fact that White Star Line normally insured its ships for about 75% of the value. So even if Olympic, sorry about that. So even if Olympic had been, uh, even if they'd the, the been able to claim insurance on the Olympic, it would have been around 1.8 million a 
like our third year Olympic Titanic was taking people from it. In fact, the insurance on the Titanic was up the week before the main, main voyage to £3.2 million, pounds, which was a nice little killing for, for Morgan. Okay, now we're getting towards the end now, we'd be pleased to hear. But this, this, is, this is very, very interesting. Okay. As we all know the wreck was discovered in, I think it was actually 1985, that's incorrect. I think it was discovered in 85 by Robert Ballard and a French underwater diving team. Uh, obviously, the, we've all seen pictures of the wreck under the sea, and it's in extremely poor condition. After well, obviously after 100 years on the sea, but it would be, wouldn't it? That's not a surprising statement at all. Now it's interesting that the grey undercoat was only used on Olympic. Titanic was black undercoat. Okay. But and, and another interesting point is that there's a picture that was taken inside the Titanic on the seabed of the marble fireplace in Ismay's cabin and it exactly matches the marble fireplace in Ismay's cabin on the Olympic. Now we all know that marbling, there's no two pieces of marble that look exactly alike, but trust me, these two pieces of marble look about as alike as it's possible to get two pieces of marble to look. And the starboard propeller on, on the Titanic at the bottom of the sea is clearly stamped 401, and I'll, and I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And what's significant of that, you may ask? Well, if you remember, when the Olympic was back in for repairs, they pinched one of the Titanic's propellers. Now, Titanic's build number was 401. So, if the propeller had been swapped, and the propeller at the bottom of the sea says 401 on it, Draw your own conclusions from that. And importantly, when Ballard looked at the, examined the wreck in detail, he had with him a set of blueprints of the Titanic. And he was really puzzled <coughs> because in the wreck it is full of longitudinal steel braces on the keel which are not in the original blu blueprint. Now, if you remember, I said that when the Olympic was repaired, it had steel braces put on the keel. Now, just, that's the previous slide where I'm just emphasizing the, there the, the steel struts to brace the keel, which was one of the repairs that were made. Remember that these, these braces did not appear in the Titanic blueprint. Okay, so there's a picture of Olympic at her launch, grey undercoat. Titanic's launch, black undercoat. I don't know how that's got in there, but it's quite interesting anyway. But if you, if you, there's, you should say C, I can't do that either. Um, you can't count them from here, but I do appreciate it. But that is Olympic photographed in Southampton in 1929, and it's got Titanic's 14 portholes. So there you go. Okay. Now, 29. It was scrapped in 37, I think, or yeah. 38, maybe. Um, okay, so let, let's examine the wreck a little bit now. I'm nearly there now, I promise. Okay, so again, it's not a very clear picture, but, but if you look at these, where the paint has run here, you can clearly see the grey undercoat peeping through. And we know that there's only a limpic that has grey undercoat. So that's an interesting little point. And there's the 401 stamps on the propeller. It's not that clear on this picture, but you can just about make it 4, 0, 1. Olymp uh, <coughs> Olympics build the most 4, 0, 0. So again, I'll, I'll make the points because it's important that that propeller was swapped. Titanic's build the most 401. So that should have said 400 on it. Had it been the Titanic. Uh, now, the other interesting point that I, I wanted to make was that it was White Starline policy to rivet the end of its ships onto the hull. It didn't engrave the. Sorry, I beg your pardon, it's the way around. It engraved the ends of its ships into the hull. It didn't put iron letters stamped and riveted onto the hull. They were actually engraved into the hull, not standing out in relief. Now, 
this is a close-up of the Titanic hull, and you can clearly see the letters M and P. Clearly, it's not that clear, but it, it's just about visible that it says M and P engraved in the hull. And that is exactly where two letters of Titanic have fallen off onto the seabed and are no longer visible. So again, it's all, it's all evidence. So that's where, that's where the letters were. So we're nearly there now. What became of these people? What happened to them all? All the, all the major players in this little conspiracy of mine. They all died on board Titanic, but significantly, I believe this is significant. None of the contemporary reports, none of the reports, none of them even attempted to escape as far as we know, which I, I find a little bit strange. At least one of them should have. But nobody ever saw them. Nobody saw them afterwards. They all sort of died quietly and just as it became of the uh, Olympic or the Titanic, whichever one you believe it is. It successfully applied its trade across the Atlantic for another 25 years or so. Lands the insurance claim. All loads of London immediately paid out the full 3.2 million. And that, just by coincidence, secured the future of both White Star Line and Holland and Wolf. And also, what became of the plans for the setting up of the huge scam that was the Federal Reserve Bank? Well, the Federal Reserve Bill was passed without serious opposition, you all be absolutely gobsmacked to hear. Uh, on the 23rd of December 1913, uh, when nine tenths of Congress had gone home for the Christmas holidays, it was introduced early that afternoon, and it was about that thick, apparently. So no one had had time to even read it, let alone digest its implications. Okay, and as I sort of mentioned earlier on. It's the beginning of the American national debt, just like the British national debt began with the Bank of England in 1694. The American national debt started in 1913 and currently stands at 16 trillion. Now, truly, truly, is a million millions for the purpose of this. It's, they're just mind-boggling numbers, and it will never be paid back ever. It's impossible. So basically, we're all in debt, or they are in debt, and their descendants as far into the future as you can possibly imagine forever, and that debt is increasing. <coughs> And more importantly, the Federal Reserve Bank enabled the bankers to fund World War I, which is what they've been aiming on doing for the previous 20 years. Uh, you know, obviously World War I started the following year. So, that's it.
things funny is like two or three years after the, what, the second world, the first world war. Yeah, started, yeah. We don't forget that even though it was in America, the Federal Reserve. I mean, th th these people transcend all countries. They don't, they, you know, they're not just Americans. These people, if you follow the pyramids to the very top, they don't have any countries at all. It's just a, it's just a free for all across all nations. You know, you could argue that all nations are only created anyway to um, create an illusion. That we live under, that, 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 that things are as they are. But th these people know no country boundaries, the country don't matter to them at all. So uh, I wouldn't attach to them. Uh, yeah, the people that can uh, question the fact that thousands of people would massacre thousands of people just to get part of their globalist plan. Yeah. You have to look at 9 11, 7 7, exactly yeah. the same scenario. So you just treat it as capital. Absolutely, you're okay. But interestingly, to go back to the time period when this happened, um, chivalry would dictate that it was uh, women and children first. Yes. And yet, Ismay got off on the industrial list and could have put a stop to the federal reserve. Well, that's the Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ismay lived in shame for the rest of his life over what he did because he actually uh, he got into a lifeboat. Um, against orders from the crew, because obviously he knows the managing director of White Star Line. It was the crew that were um, in charge, basically. He had to do what they said, because you know, when they were at sea, they were his boss, not the other way around. And they actually said, no, you can't go in. And, and he just got in. And he lived in shame for the rest of his life, and he, and he died in the 19, late 1920s, I think it was. But he, 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 he immediately resigned from the White Star Line as soon as he got back to England. And his name was... Um, very black for the rest of the line. It points, it points to the fact that they were probably killed on board rather than I to get the chance that they might have done power and have got more like his and himself. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, because they, they, they would have stopped and said that said it and sort of yeah, I, I see the point you're making. Yeah. Can I ask, you know, the sequel that you said for Samson that was in the way so the yes. ship didn't see the flyers from the Titanic, was yes. that put there on purpose? I don't think so, no. I think so that was just... Still it. That funny, Exactly, yeah, I think it was just, it's just one of those things that happen, isn't it? That just seems so silly to have gone to all those lengths, <laughs> and then somebody yeah. just got in I mean, you know, I'm not, I don't claim for one minute that this is absolutely exactly what happened. I'm just putting this forward as a hypothesis. And, but a, a lot of the stuff I have actually, you know, I, I've not made anything up, put it that way. I, but what I have done is built a story around the stuff that I have found out, if you understand what I'm saying. So I'm not saying that my story is absolutely what Correct, but what I am saying is everything that I've had researched and found out here. So, was there even someone else on the boat that discovered that they. The, Sorry, just move over here, I can't see that one. The three Pastor Strauss and Guggenheimer, what happened to them, do you think? I think they were murdered. I absolutely think they were murdered, and, the, and the, the, the ship sinking was just a cover for them. How did they get them on the boat? Did somebody give them the ticket? No, because well, the, the, this is what I was saying about the maiden voyage of Titanic. It was made out to be this this great thing, and anybody who is anybody is going to be on there, you know. So that's why it was all hyped up to get people like that. It, they probably had an invite, but I think they, I think they paid for their own passages. I, I'm pretty sure they did. Yeah. Yeah, because somebody with an agent was on there. I I would say it's absolutely almost certain. Yeah. See, it's interesting when you read the thing at the back of the book about all the people who were on board. Yeah. How, how fruitless some of these lives were when you consider that when they when they did all the survivors, it was all Lord such and such a person and manservant all the way down. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yet you Absolutely. got probably seventy percent of them were, were, were not even working class, were they? That's right. Yeah, no, very very few working class people actually survived. You know, it was it was very top heavy towards first class. Yeah. And. Second class a little bit more, but uh, third class, but not as much as first, you know what I mean? Hi. Can you just enlarge that sentence? Because I don't think that was on your comment when they were planning the first world war. Yes. <laughs> it's a very big picture. And, I mean, the Titanic incident is just one tiny little jigsaw puzzle in a massive, massive picture. Okay. Were they planning a war of any war, or was it going to be between England and Germany? It was going to be between England and Germany because Germany, it was regarded in elite circles, shall we say, that Germany was getting too big for its boots. Right? Germany was taking trade markets away from the 
the, the British and the American corporations, which ruled the world then just as much as they do now. So Germany needed to be taught a lesson. So they had to, they had to find some Trump to charge to, uh, to, to, pit, to nail Germany. So that was all going on. But they needed more than anything, they needed the finance. And the way that the, the final nail in the, the final piece in the jigsaw puzzle of World War I was the Federal Reserve scam. Because it, within months they generated enough money because they could just print it to actually carry that out. But they've been wanting that all along. And it's, I mean, the, the whole history of the 20, 20th century I found extremely interesting because although all the stuff happened that you hear about, it certainly wasn't for the reasons that you hear about. You know, you, World War I was designed to end as it did so that World War II could happen, and which, which is exactly what happened because um, at the end of World War I, Germany had such horrific reparations to pay. They didn't finish paying it until 2009, by the way. Did you know that? World War I reparations. Um, that they knew it would cause extreme austerity in Germany and extreme, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, that there'd be extreme parties such as the Nazis that would come to power. And they actually fund, you know, it was Americans that funded the Nazis anyway. Um, because it was all part of the same master plan. They don't leave anything to chance, these people. I know it sounds fantastic to anybody who's not come across these ideas before. But I've been researching this stuff for like 10 years or more. And you know, that, that's what I do. I don't have a job. I'm a full-time researcher and author now. And, and honestly, when you delve scraps just a little bit below the surface, there's, the world is not at all like you imagine it to be. Not at all. So, Why do you say before 1972? Oh, I beg your pardon. Sorry. If I have my three wishes, I can do an hour. Right, right. Yeah. Well, all, all wars are artificial constructs. They're all, they're, they're all done for not the reasons that they tell you they're done for. It's mainly about making money. We could go on all night about it. It's such a big topic. What's your take on what is going on? Oh, yes, how long have you got? <laughs> um, um, well, again, it's only my view. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, suggest to speak for everyone, but, uh, you know, it's all, part of the, it's all part of the same thing. It's about control of populations. I mean, when you think about it, you know, let's just take the Greek situation and the Spanish situation as an example. You know, who does Greece owe all this money to? Or is it to the EU? Who does Spain owe it all to? Oh, it was all to the EU. Every nation is in debt to the EU or to other countries in the EU. Why not just say, all right, well, that debt pays off that debt, that debt pays off that debt. It's all artificial constructs. They do it to keep us all in a state of fear and poverty because that's the only way they control us. That's the only way 10,000 people can control 7 billion people. And it's all part of that bigger picture. And again, it's, it's not the sort of thing that you can just... Um, address in a, in a, in a two-minute soundbite, if you know what I mean. It, it, it's a much, much bigger picture and there's a lot, lot more to it. I mean, it's just staggering in its complexities. You can't put it all down to the central banking cartel. Okay? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's them. It's them that, they're, 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 I don't know if you heard what he said, but he said that you can put it all down to the central banking cartel and exactly, and that's what the Federal Reserve was about. It's, everything is down to them. These people own the earth, yeah? They own the earth, they own governments, they own corporations. If you follow any pyramid to the top in society, they're there. And they control all governments, everything. They're all puppets dancing to the tune of these people, these bankers who own the earth. I know it's a, I know it's a difficult concept to get your head around if you've never sort of encountered anything like that before, but, you know, it, it is... It is the case. Yes, sir. Well, that bank is shown to all love because they create money out of nothing. And absolutely. Uh, it's the prerogative of the country to produce its own money. That's all so it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And they all if, just call the bluff. <laughs> well, if the British government, or if any government, created its own money, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have a national debt. 
There wouldn't be a national bank. That's what's happening. Well, it doesn't have to borrow money. Exactly. Bank absolutely, absolutely. And, well, well, there's Japanese that's supposed to be borrowing 700 million Japanese to build a nuclear power station. Yeah. Well, if we accept that, they loan 700 million worth of Britain. But it, if the government that created 200 million to build a power station, that will contribute to the wealth of the nation. Yeah. And we get all the benefit and we own it. So there's this Japanese law. Mm. Investment that's mm. going to be supposed to come from Japan. We just want stopping issues, nothing. Yeah. They create our nothing and it becomes money when we accept it as money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we just, so, we yeah. just produce our own money. It's just another tiny little strand in the whole spider's web is going on. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, the, yeah. so the, there was a story that it might have been some by a top figure. You did mention that, that another ship there. Well, it could have been, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was just my presumption that it might have been an icebreaker. It could have been a torpedo for all I know, yeah. Have you ever read the idea? I've read it. No. Well, I mean, one thing I didn't mention in the presentation, well, then perhaps I ought to, is that the, 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 the actual hole in the side of Titanic was very strange. It was a very strange shape. It was about that wide, and it was about 60 metres long. But the interesting thing about it was that it actually penetrated 1.6 metres into the ship. Now, how can a piece of ice do that? Have you ever seen a piece of ice, that shape? That's, that's 1.6 metres long and only that wide and yet can break through steel. So what are you actually saying? Then? Well, I'm saying, I definitely, I'm, I'm saying I don't think it was ice that did it. So what do you think so you actually I think it was an icebreaker. Fair. Oh yeah, it's done yeah. But uh, I suppose I'm more saying that it wasn't ice rather than what it actually was. Yeah, I think it's a fantastic, yeah, a really complex subject. Thank you very much. Absolutely splendid. Thank you.